Okay, so it's my pleasure to announce this talk of Jesse. It's on constant Q curvature matrix with isolated singularities where you can see the length and type. And it's a pleasure to have you here. So let's just dive in. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to thank all the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. And um, I'm excited to share this, this, um, this work with you. And um, so I'm going to tell you about a fourth order invariant. And um, if I have a Ramanian manifold of dimension greater than five, I can define this Q curvature, curvature gadget as um, a combination of Ricci and scalar curvature. The leading order term is minus the Laplacian of the scalar curvature. There are some coefficients here they're not particularly um, important. Just know that there are some coefficients there. They look rather complicated, but you shouldn't be too scared of them. And the Q curvature transforms under conformal change with this very nice rule that um, the Q curvature of your conformally related metric is U to a certain power times a differential operator applied to you. And this differential operator looks like the bi Laplacian plus some second order divergence terms plus the Q curvature itself. Um, and this should remind you a lot of the of what happens with scalar curvature. Um, so you should think of the Q curvature as a fourth order variant of scalar curvature. So it seems like there is, um, I think I am using full screen mode. Uh, let me see. Uh, but we don't see full screen. You don't see full screen. Let's it doesn't try hurt, it's not this. <laughs> Shall we try this again? Yeah, that's perfect. No, actually, now we just see you. <laughs> At yeah, least. and now I'm going to share the screen once more. Great, perfect. Did that work? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, so under this um, conformal change, the, this, the Q curvature transforms according to this nice law, and you should think of this as a fourth order variant of um, the, the famous um, transformation rule for the scalar curvature, which we'll discuss in, in a fair amount of detail in a couple of minutes. So the thing to pay attention to with this operator is that it is a fourth order operator and the leading order term is the square of the Laplacian. Um, also, it does have divergence structure. Um, so this operator motivates us to define the following functional, which you should think of as the total Q curvature functional. And there, there's a normalizing factor here. This normalizing factor dividing by the volume just means that the whole functional is scale invariant. If I change my conformal factor here by multiple, if I multiply my u by some constant like lambda, then I leave this quotient unchanged. And again, this should remind you of what happens in the case of scalar curvature. Now that I have this functional, I can think of enthemizing over the whole conformal class, and I end up with this um, fourth order variant of the Imabe invariant. So um, the four here in the subscript is supposed to indicate that I am looking at a fourth order, um, a fourth order curvature quantity. The plus here means that when I'm taking this enthemum, so I can think of this enthemum geometrically, but I also think of this enthemum in a, a functional theoretic point of view from the writing everything in terms of the background metric. And um, 
a priori, I could think of taking this in theorem over all possible functions which are um, not identically zero, and um, I could allow u to change sign. But I only want to take an infimum over um, geometric quantities. I only want to take an infimum over positive functions. So that's what this plus sign is supposed to indicate. Once I have this conformal invariant, I can then take a supremum over all conformal classes, and that gives me a differential invariant. And this is exactly what um, Yamabe defined in the 1960s. Um, so it's fairly standard to show that my um, total Q curvature functional is differentiable, say on the space of um, positive functions with two weak derivatives in L2. And it's also straightforward to show that the critical points of this functional are exactly the metrics within the conformal class with constant Q curvature. And it's also fairly straightforward to show that for any given conformal class, this infimum is finite. You don't have minus infinity as an infimum. Um, okay, so at this point, we're going to have a small history lesson. And I'm going to have to keep this brief because there's a lot of, there are very many people that worked on these problems. This is still a very active area of research. And um, so apologies if somehow your name is not mentioned and you've worked on scalar curvature, but there's, there's a lot here. Um, so every, everything that I've said has an analog in the Yamabe problem. In 1960, Yamabe asked whether it is possible to find a constant scalar curvature representative in any given conformal class of a compact manifold of dimension n greater than or equal to three. So you should think of this as um, a higher dimensional analog of the Poincare uni uniformization theorem. So Poincare's uniformization says that um, for, a for a closed surface, um, there is a constant Gauss curvature representative um, within that conformal class. And so if the genus is positive, if the genus is um, zero, then you have to have a flat metric. If the genus is um, negative, then you have to have the um, a hyperbolic metric and so on. Um, so Yamabe proposed this problem as higher dimensional analog of, um, of this uniformization theorem and proposed trying to find constant scalar curvature metrics. Um, so the scalar curvature of a conformally related metric transforms according to this very nice law. This looks very much like what I had a couple slides previously for the Q curvature. And just as in the Q curvature case, one defines the total scalar curvature functional, which again, this is a nice scale invariant quantity. And again, um, this uh, functional R is differentiable and the constants, the constant scalar curvature metrics are exactly the critical points of the total scalar curvature functional. Again, you can define the infimum of the total scalar curvature functional. This is the classical Yamabe invariant, which is an invariant of the conformal class. Um, and then you can take a supremum over all conformal classes and obtain this differentiable invariant. So the, this, many people, many, many people worked on this problem over the next 25 years. And among them, Yamabe himself and Trudinger and Aban made some very substantial partial progress. And eventually, Rick Shane um, answered Yamabe's question in the positive. So he showed that, um, so very specifically, he showed that every conformal class admits a constant scalar curvature metric. This Yamabe invariant here, the in, infimum over the conformal class, is this infimum is actually a minimum. Um, this infimum is always less than or equal to 
the value you obtain for the round metric on the sphere. Equality in this infimum is only realized in the case of the round sphere. And, um, and moreover, the, the sphere is really somewhat surprisingly the difficult case, even though it's, it's um, sort of the compact manifold, which is best understood, the fact that it, it's in a way the nicest compact manifold because it has the most symmetry. But in another way, all of that symmetry leads to certain difficulties, which we'll, um, we'll see in a moment. Um, so I want to also highlight that um, this result, uh, the, the, this solution of the Amabe problem from, uh, from Rick was um, in the mid 1980s, this was a long time ago, but it's still, this is still a very active area of research. Um, so for instance, it was fairly recently shown that in high dimensions, the, um, the, 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 the set of minimizers does not need to be compact. Um, and there, there's a lot of work still being done. So I've apparently, oh, do you remind the term in the class? Ah, yeah. So the variational formulation. So let's see if I can backtrack. Oh. So we'll just recall these operators. The script L is this. So you should think of script L as essentially minus the Laplacian plus a potential. You should think of this operator here, P, as the by Laplacian plus second order divergence terms plus a potential. Um, the particular form of these terms, we don't really need to pay a whole lot of attention to. You just need to know the leading order term is, by the, is the by Laplacian. You have second order divergence terms and you have a potential term. Right. Where were we? Okay. So the, the Shane solution of the Amabe problem really highlights the fact that um, the sphere is um, is an important example to think about. And if I want to look for um, if I want to look for conformal metrics on the sphere, say conformal to the round metric, I can normalize my Q curvature to be this value, which is the value you actually obtain for the round sphere. Um, that transforms my equation for the, this panelist operator, this P into this thing, which looks much, which is much more, it is much easier to look at. It's just the by Laplacian of U is equal to um, U to a certain power. Um, this constant here, this in this constant multiplying the u to a power is is not particularly important it's there to make um certain values work out nicely and the important thing to pay attention to here is the exponent in uh, multiplying u here and this exponent is the the critical sobolev exponent for the embedding of w22 into lp um, and it, this is exactly where that embedding from the sub of embedding loses compactness. Okay. So the usual round metric from the sphere, of course, gives, yes, um, n is greater than four. Yes, I'm always assuming that, that I have a dimension greater than four. Thank you. Um, so I, of course, obtain a solution from the standard round sphere. It looks like this. I can rescale that solution, and I get these guys. Um, so there's a theorem by C.S. Lin from 1998 or 1999, which says that um, all of the positive global solutions on all of our end of this equation are exactly these guys. Um, 
And a funny thing happens to these solutions when lambda goes to zero. When lambda goes to zero, we see that um, these solutions go to zero outside of any fixed neighborhood of my point x naught, but they blow up at x naught. So what this is doing geometrically is it's actually concentrating all of the volume, all of the geometry. Um, one needs a condition, I am sorry, what condition? Um, one needs a condition for the, oh, okay, I think you're, so one needs a condition, are you, I think you're speaking about this theorem of C.S. Lin, and actually for this particular case, you don't need a condition for the dimension four result when this nonlinearity is an exponential nonlinearity, you do need a condition which amounts to finite total Q curvature. At least that's, yeah. Um, right, so where were we? Um, the, right, so what, what this blow up behavior highlights is that if you want to really understand um, the totality of constant Q curvature metrics in a conformally flat spet in a conformally flat setting, you need to understand isolated singularities. Um, so on that note, there's a fairly recent result um, from early um, 2019, which said that if you have a solution of this equation, which is by Laplacian of u is equal to u to the power n plus four over n minus four, um, and this solution is also um, is also subharmonic. Um, then, sorry, superharmonic. The solution is also superharmonic. Then um, the the solution looks asymptotically symmetric. So I can write this as u of x is the average value of u over um, length of x times the times one plus something that is small. Um, and if I want to phrase this theorem ge geometrically, I would say that. Um, in the locally conformally flat match in the locally conformally flat setting, um, if I have an isolated singularity of a constant Q curvature metric, which also has constant scalar, which also has positive scalar curvature, then this metric becomes asymptotically rotationally symmetric as one approaches the singular point. Um, so it's a local computation to see that actually the positive scalar curvature is a little bit stronger than this condition here. Um, right. So if I want to um, tell you some refined asymptotics, I need to introduce something. And unfortunately, these Euclidean coordinates are a little bit inconvenient. So what I really want to do is introduce cylindrical co coordinates. Now, what this transformation does is it takes my um, it transforms the punctured ball into a half an infinite cylinder where um, t goes from zero to plus infinity. And again, theta is your usual um, angular coordinate. Um, and what this factor in front here does, this exponential e to the uh, four minus n over two times t, what this does is it kind of, um, normalizes everything. And if I do this change of variables, I find that um, my original PDE transforms to something. So I actually don't need to pay too much attention to, we'll come back to the important features of what this is. So the important thing is that I have the same sort of right hand side. I have something that looks like a fourth order operator. So, oops, sorry. I have something that looks like a fourth order derivative in t and uh, by Laplacian in the theta variables. I have some mixed second order terms here. I have some pure second order terms here and I have my um, potential term here. Um, and it turns out that um, you can, 
you can find all of the positive global solutions. So now this is, these are positive global. So what is the global setting? The global setting in this setting is the whole cylinder, the real line cross SN minus one. And if I have transformed this back to Euclidean coordinates, these will be all of the global solutions on RN minus the origin. Um, and so some of them, you know, of course, there's the sphere, which is an incomplete solution. And if I transform it to, from my Euclidean coordinates to my cylindrical coordinates, the sphere solution has this very nice form, which is cosh to a certain power. There is um, a constant solution in the cylindrical coordinates, which looks like this. And it turns out that this constant is between zero and one. Um, the fact that this is between zero and one is uh, a consequence of the fact that n is greater than four. Um, and then um, about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, Frank and Koenig classified all positive global solutions on the cylinder of um, of this PDE. And it turns out that they are all very nice periodic functions of T alone. So I'll highlight a couple of them. Here's the cylinder solution, this red line right here. There's the spherical solution, which starts out, um, starts out at one when T is equal to zero and decays off. And then between these, interpolating between the cylinder and the sphere, I have these nice bounded periodic solutions and they're parameterized by, so I've parameterized these by um, the bulge height, the height of the bulge, which is the maximum value of this V. Um, it takes values between this um, epsilon n bar, the value you obtain for the cylinder and one. Um, Equivalently, you could choose to parameterize this by the neck. There's really not much difference. The other thing I want to point out here is that the period um, changes. And in fact, when I increase my bulge height, when I increase my epsilon, I will also increase my period and that the period goes to infinity as epsilon goes to one. Okay. Um, all right, so here's the first statement of a theorem. So the statement I have here says that if I have a positive solution in a punctured ball, um, which also satisfies its superharmonic, I do my cylindrical change of variables. And I have two possibilities. So the first possibility is that just that my original function extends to be a smooth solution um, at the origin which is equivalent to saying that the limb inf of uh, V is, is zero as T goes to infinity. Um, and the other possibility is that, um, is that I can write the difference between my V and a certain translate, a certain translate of my Delaunay solution as um, something that decays exponentially and the rate of decay is, um, is um, the exponential rate of decay is greater than one. Okay, so the actual form of my translated Delaunay solution is down here, um, but I'm gonna actually write out how I got this formula and what it means on the next slide. Um, but we should take from this statement is that my V, my solution to this PDE, my, the, the conformal factor for my um, constant Q curvature metric is a translated Delaunay solution plus something which decays like e to the minus beta t where beta is greater than one. Um, I should say also that you can, uh, I'm, I'm, you can adapt my proof here and you can obtain further terms in, it's very, very straightforward to obtain higher order terms from my proof. Okay, so 
where do these translated um, DLNAs come from? So I have my original DLNA solution, which I write now back in Euclidean coordinates. Now I want to keep my singular point actually at the origin, so I don't want to translate that, but I can translate the point at infinity. And how do I translate the point at infinity? What I do is I take a Kelvin transform, do a translation and take a Kelvin transform back. So if I write that all out, I have this guy right here. And um, if I expand, um, uh, yes, we have a question from someone. Of course, you, you may ask, should I, are there solutions to the Q curvature problem? Okay, yes, that is an excellent question. So, um, and I'm going to table that, but I will get back to it, I promise. <laughs> So, so there's a question asking whether one can always, so I think you're asking whether one can always find a constant Q curvature metric in any given conformal class. I think that's what you're asking. Oh no, sorry, you meant, let's just unmute you. Let's see if I can find you and unmute you and then you can ask your question. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask myself. Um... So what you're calculating here, are these solutions uh, to the Q cur curvature problem or to the scalar y Yamabe problem? Yes, yes. No, 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 no. These are solutions to the Q curvature problem. Ah, okay. um, there are very similar behaving solutions to the scalar curvature problem. Okay, thanks. Can the speaker ask, ans can the speaker ask the question he raised himself? Ah. Um, yes, I will get back to that. <laughs> Promise. Um, right. So where were we? Um, yeah. So these translated DLNA solutions, if I transform back to my cylindrical coordinates, I obtain something that looks like this. So what I should take from this is that my translated DLNA solutions actually look like my original DLNA plus some term which decays like e to the minus t. And then the next order term is going to decay like e to the minus 2t. So if I go back and I look at um, what my expansion is saying, is saying that my... Um, V, my original V is the DLNA solution plus some specific thing that decays like e to the minus t plus something decay that which decays like e to the minus b to t. Okay, um, right. So I want to discuss a theorem about the analog of the Yamabe invariant. So there's a theorem from, I think, two years ago by Feng Bo Hong and Paul Young. And um, this theorem says that if I have a compact Ramani manifold of dimension n greater than or equal to five, the classical Yamabe invariant is positive, the Q curvature is non-negative, but not identically zero, then um, the fourth order Yamabe invariant is less than or equal to the one you obtain for the round sphere. Equality can only occur in the case of the round sphere. And in this case, um, in this case, there is a representative in the conformal class, which realizes this in femum. And in particular, there is a representative within the conformal class, um, which has constant Q curvature. Okay, so now I will pause and I will answer this question of can one solve the analog of the Yamabe problem? In certain cases, yes. So the, there's a theorem of um, Matt Gursky and Andrea Malchiotti, which states that if you have, um, if your manifold has positive Yamabe invariant and some other positive positivity conditions, you can solve the analog of the Yamabe problem. There is a representative in the conformal class 
um, with constant Q curvature. And um, the, the heart of their proof is to show that um, one can apply a version of the maximum principle. Um, and from there, they, 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 um, they, they build a, a non-local flow and show that the flow exists for all time and converges to a solution. Um, it's, it's a very, very difficult um, result. Um, there was more recently a paper by Yannick Sire and I'm forgetting the co-author and it states that basically whenever there is a global maximum principle, one can um, solve this version of the Yamabe problem. So what these theorems highlight is the difference between this fourth order and the, all of these higher order problems and the classical Yamabe problem, the classical scalar curvature problem, which is in the um, scalar curvature case, you have a second order operator, you can apply the maximum principle. And in these cases, you usually cannot. Um, and as far as my understanding of, of the state of affairs goes, um, basically, we as a community are a little bit behind where we were in the when Shane solved resolved the Yamabe problem. We're a little bit behind. We're 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 at about 1981, 1982 in terms of the technology for this problem. Um, so I think this is a very difficult problem that we should, you know, I would encourage you all to work on. Um, so I hope that's uh, a little bit informative. Okay, so I want to tell you uh, a theorem and this is very much like a big opportunity for analysts. Absolutely, big opportunity for, for many people involved. Um, yes. So I want to tell you a theorem about um, the um, about this conformal invariant, which says that if I look at my invariant on a circle crossed with an n minus one dimensional sphere, and I equip it with this particular conformal class, um, when I change my capital T, of course, these metrics will not be conformal. So this gives me now a family of conformal classes. If I look at my invariant on this conformal, on this family of conformal classes, I find that uh, in the limit when t goes, when capital T goes to infinity, I obtain actually the, the value of the round sphere. Um, so in particular, my differential invariant of S1 crossed Sn minus one is equal to that of the round sphere. And, um, as a consequence of the result on the previous slide by Han and Yang, the, there cannot be a, a smooth metric on S1 cross N, Sn minus one realizing this equality. Um, so on the face of it, this might look a little bit weird, but actually if you understand the Delaunay metrics, this is somewhat, um, this is fairly easy. Um, so the, the proof of this theorem is really just that um, you take the, the Delaunay metric um, uh, with um, T epsilon equal capital T and then take a limit. And in the limit you obtain the, the conformal class of the round sphere. Okay, so I want to say a couple words about um, proofs. Um, and I think that if I can um, convey some things, um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be satisfied. So there's a general outline, <coughs> excuse me, there's a general outline of this um, asymptotics result, which is, um, so the first step is that you need some a priori estimates. Um, so the a priori estimates in Euclidean coordinates look like my u blows up as um, length of x to the four minus n over two. If I do my change to cylindrical coordinates, it just says that my, my v is bounded between two positive constants. So this is really, this 
highlights the fact that my cylindrical coordinates are kind of the right thing to look at. Um, so I'll just say a couple words about this. The upper bound comes from a rescaling argument. Um, you suppose the upper bound does not hold and you um, rescale about some blow up points and you obtain a global solution on all of Rn in the limits. And um, what this gives you is a, a geodesic sphere in your conformal metric with a concave boundary, but that can't happen. Um, the lower limit comes from looking at a certain integral identity called the Pud Sif invariant. Um, and basically you show that if the um, Pud Sif invariant is zero, then, um, then the solution actually has to extend to the origin and otherwise if the post type invariant is negative, then, um, then you have this bound. So once you establish these um, a priori bounds, you choose a sequence, any sequence, tau k's, which I'll go to infinity, and you look at translates. And um, so the, the, these translates, this is called a slide back sequence. And observe that these vk's are defined for t greater than minus tau k. And um, so I have now, um, by Rizela Scully, a, a, I can extract a sequence which converges uniformly on com compact subsets. And because it converges uniformly, it must converge to a solution. But I know what all my solutions are, and my solutions are these Delaunay solutions. Um, so I know that I have a subsequence which converges uniformly to a translate of a Delaunay um, solution. And um, so now the difficult part is to show that the two parameters, the epsilon and the capital T, do not depend on any of the choices I made. So for instance, I chose some some arbitrary sequence of positive numbers going to infinity, tau k, and then from that I chose the subsequence. Um, so the, the fact that your limit does not actually depend on any of these choices really comes from an in-depth analysis of this Jacobi operator, um, of this linearized Q curvature operator. And um, so if you unwind what the fact that this, if you unwind what all this means, you obtain a simple asymptotics result, which looks like this, which is basically what Jin and Shang showed. And once you obtain these simple asymptotics, you go back to all of the work you did with the linear analysis and bootstrap a little bit, and you obtain the refined asymptotics result. So that's a very brief sketch of how the asymptotics theorem um, goes. So a um, couple of comments. Um, so what I've just outlined is basically what was done in the scalar curvature setting by Nick Korvar, Rafe Mitzel, Frank Packard, and Rick Shane. And um, this whole technique of constructing a slide back sequence as far as I understand, goes back to Leon Simon in the early 1980s, where he was trying to construct um, proved uniqueness of limit tangent cones to certain minimal surfaces. Okay, so let's look at the ODE for the Delaunay solutions. This is the ODE. Um, so I can multiply this ODE by, so the dot here refers to derivative with respect to T. The, I can multiply this ODE by um, V dot and I can integrate. And when I do that, I obtain this conserved quantity. Um, and what's kind of amazing about about the, the fourth order ODE we're studying 
is that actually, even though it's a fourth order ODE, it behaves like a second order ODE. What do I mean by that? I mean that this energy is actually enough to specify a solution curve. So usually you would need um, two more integral quantities, two more conserved quantities to, to completely specify a solution curve. But actually, if you restrict your attention to bounded solutions, there's a, um, a paper by Jan van der Berg, which proves that ODEs of this form, um, so this V, this F of V here has to be um, just C1. They, 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 they all have an, uh, an integral, they all have an integral uh, conserved quantity, which looks basically like this. Um, and that the, this integral, this conserved quantity actually determines um, all of your solutions. So, in particular, there's energy ordering. If you have, um, if you have um, a, a bigger initial value, then you have to have a larger energy. If you have, um, if you specify two initial values, if you specialize, say, V and V dot at a point to to this ODE, then you actually specify a unique solution, so long as you're restricting attention to either bounded solutions or positive solutions. Um, so it's really quite, um, quite there, there's really something very special going on here. Um, so I want to draw a picture of the energy setting, and that is right here. So what do I see when I look here? I see my um, cylindrical solution. This is at the bottom of an energy well. Um, I see my spherical solution, which lives at energy script H equals zero, and it's this curve here. Um, so I've normalized everything so that the maximum value is assumed at T is equal to zero, and in this case, the maximum value is one. Then I get this solution here. That's the sphere. For all maximum values between this one and this number I get for the cylindrical solution, I have a unique trajectory which passes through here, which gives me a nice periodic solution. Um, the zero set of my energy is this blue curve together with this um, stationary point at the origin. Um, and then it's possible to show that um, the positive energy levels all cross into the um, V less than zero half space. So they can't give you, they cannot give you conformal classes um, because your conformal factor can't be, conformal factor cannot be negative. <coughs> right. So, so th this is this is an important picture to understand just what is going on. And again, I should state that the, one obtains the exact the exact same picture in the scalar curvature setting um, in a number of different settings. Okay, so from here, you want to study the linearization of the Q curvature operator when you linearize about a Delaunay solution. And it's helpful to actually write your solution in, in Fourier series. So um, what am I doing here? I'm writing, so the lambda j's are just the eigenvalues of the spherical Laplacian on Sn minus one. These are what they're, all their possible values. In particular, lambda naught is zero and lambda one through lambda n are all n minus one. Um, and I obtain now a family of um, fourth order ODEs. Um, and the low Fourier modes actually arise geometrically. So I want to just highlight that. So the low Fourier modes, um, there's one I obtain by taking V dot. So this amounts to, um, this amounts to translating along the axis of the Delaunay solution. 
and there's another solution which is um, the derivative which is with respect to the del and a parameter um, so this first solution here is a nice periodic function and this solution here grows linearly so the fact that this grows linearly comes is a immediate consequence of the fact that the um, derivative of the period is always positive. Um, and the next terms you obtain come from translating off the axis, essentially. So um, how do I build those? I look at my translated Delaunay solutions and I take a derivative of the translation parameter. And when I do that, I obtain something which decays exponentially. I can also translate the origin, which corresponds to translating um, my t is equal to infinity and in cylindrical coordinates. And then I obtain uh, a Jacobi field, a solution which grows linearly. And these grow at specific, these grow at a precise rate of e to the plus t, or they decay at e to the minus t. Um, so the, the heart of the rest of the proof is really to show that, um, that the only tempered solutions, the only solutions to my Jacobi operator of sub-exponential growth are, um, are these two. And once I know I have these two, and particularly the only bounded solution is this one. Um, once I know I have that, I can, um I, I i can obtain I, I can obtain a good enough control on my jacobi operator so in particular i can show that um away from that 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 my jacobi operator is um fred holm has a, a nice solution operator on certain weighted function spaces so long as i stay away from a discrete set of bad weights which i can um compute the first several. Um, so there's a lot of very in-depth analysis, which I'm actually going to skip over here. And um, so it's all very interesting, but there's, it's, there's, there's a, a lot one can find. And I want to just give you a very quick proof of this this um, theorem I was telling you of the conformal invariance and give you some references. So if I have, <coughs> excuse me, if I have a metric in the conformal class of, so remember this G capital T is just D, DT squared plus the D theta squared. So if I have this um, conformal metric, I can extend this to be a T periodic function on a cylinder. And then because I know what all these solutions are, I know that the, I only have the del and a solutions. Um, and I can do a strom louisville analysis to show that among the T periodic solutions, the least energy one is the V epsilon such that T epsilon is equal to capital T. Um, and then once I know that, I can compute that I know my Yamabe invariant is equal to what I obtain for this particular DLNA metric, but I can explicitly compute this and show that in the limit I obtain the invariant for the round sphere. Um, and the ingredient of this last step in the convergence is just the fact that um, the the when epsilon goes to one the v epsilons converge uniformly to the spherical solutions on that's of the real line okay so i want to give you a couple of references the chin shong paper i i referenced earlier this appeared on archive in january of 2019 um i myself had two papers so this First one from January of this year is about the isolated, the asymptotic um, expansion of isolated singularities. And the second paper from February is um, about the fourth order conformal invariant. 
There's a related paper by Jean Enrique Anzede and Marcos de O, um, which proves a very similar result for a related conformally invariant fourth order system. And um, with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention.